Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, the Director of the Project on Middle East Political Science and the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Welcome back to our series of POMAPS conversations with leading scholars in the field of political science in the Middle East. With me today is Christopher Davidson, who's a reader in Government and International Affairs at Durham University and the author of, uh, of a new book, After the Sheikhs, The Coming Collapse of the Gulf Monarchies which is an extremely popular book in the Gulf, I learned when I was there in, uh, in uh, January, um, for different reasons on different sides of the political divide. And uh, today, I think it would be nice to, to talk about the book and, uh, and, and its development. Um, and I think before we get to the, the, I think, more controversial part of the book, which is the predictions about the future, why don't we talk a little bit about the analysis underlying it? Uh, what do you see as the major problems uh, in the Gulf, and what is it that uh, that you saw uh, when you were surveying the various countries of the GCC that made you believe that they were in such jeopardy? Well, th thank you, Mark. Uh, quite some years ago, uh, in fact, shortly after I finished my PhD fieldwork, I began to think of the lack of um, political culture explanations uh, existing in the academic literature on the survival and resilience of the Gulf monarchies, which are, after all, an extremely unusual political system, not just in the region, but elsewhere in the world. Uh, I was particularly interested in treating these uh, uh, societies and these uh, political systems, um, looking at their own, uh, their own inherent characteristics, uh, the domestic pathologies in these states, uh, the various pressures that were building long before the Arab Spring, and what likely, uh, what likely uh, output these pressures would have in the near future. Um, I was particularly um, interested to look at how various uh, uh, political economy pressures were building alongside um, uh, declining legitimacy and a declining ability for these uh, rulers to maintain, uh, in some cases, decades-old social contracts. And you know, you, so you you identify a number of political economy pressures as as the driving force. Um, to the naive outsider, it looks like these countries are doing quite well, though, with uh, oil prices high, uh, new natural gas discoveries, and places like Kuwait with record budget surpluses. So what exactly is the nature of the political economy challenges which these states face? Well, we have, set, we have several pathologies and pressures building here. Um, we have, of course, uh, distribution-based economies where, for the most part in these states, citizens expect a certain amount of largesse from their states and their, and their governments in the form of uh, tax-free lifestyles, uh, government housing, welfareism, and so on. Um, also, the expectation of public sector employment in many of the smaller, richer Gulf monarchies. These uh, models seem to, seem to be becoming increasingly unsustainable as fresh generations ex expect the same, if not better, benefits than previous generations. We still have oil-rich uh, countries in the region, but not all of the Gulf monarchies are uh, rich in hydrocarbons. We already perhaps have some ugly glimpses into the future with poorer Gulf monarchies such as Bahrain, uh, uh, Oman, and even to some extent Saudi Arabia, which although is considered an oil-rich country and a wealthy state, should at best be considered a mi middle-income economy given the large number of citizens that have to have their wealth, uh, the wealth distributed to them. So we're likely to see, um, especially as many of these Gulf governments have tried to buy their way through the Arab Spring with higher and higher public spending programs, uh, in some cases with uh, budget deficits predicted in the next few years, even though we have these large surpluses coming from oil and gas revenues at present, it's likely these spending programs will have to be sustained for quite a few years to come. Well, let's break that down um, between the different types. I think you're, you're on to something important. Um, Saudi Arabia is, is one kind of case where you have a large population and some you know, distinctive pathologies. Your original research was done in the UAE, and it seems like the UAE and Qatar might be kind of a unique set, very small populations, extremely wealthy. Does it make sense to group them with the Bahrain, Oman, Saudi Arabia, I suppose Kuwait is somewhere in the middle. Yes, I think there's often a, often a danger to um, uh, paint the six Gulf monarchies with the same broad brush. They are very different countries. Uh, we have, of course, some uh, extremely high GDP per capita states, such as Qatar and United Arab Emirates, uh, where we have very small indigenous populations. 
uh, and very high uh, hydrocarbon wealth. But even in these states, we have uh, backyards that have not necessarily received the attention they should have in recent years. In the United Arab Emirates, there's a growing wealth disparity between the wealthier emirates of Abu Dhabi and Dubai and the five poorer ones, where in fact, almost the bulk of citizens live. Even in Qatar, we have talk of wealth disparity and growing poverty among some sections of the Qatari uh, population. Now, what about um, uh, Saudi Arabia specifically, since uh, that really is the, the linchpin of the GCC system, and it was Saudi Arabia that obviously came to the assistance of the poorer Gulf monarchies financially, militarily, politically. Um, and so how would you assess uh, the, the Saudi response to the Arab Spring and uh, the prospects for, for Saudi survival? Yes, uh, the future of Saudi Arabia will very much impact on the future of the five uh, smaller Gulf monarchies on its doorstep. That's without any doubt. What we've seen really with Saudi Arabia is a, a, a two-sided response to the Arab Spring. Firstly, trying to increase spending, trying to spend their way out of this crisis, hoping that the Arab Spring is a short-term phenomenon and that the Arab Spring will end with the borders of the Syrian conflict, will not spread further south. This has been extended to poorer parts of the Gulf too, and even, in some cases, poorer Arab monarchies beyond the Gulf, such as Morocco and Jordan. After all, Saudi Arabia has to persuade the other Gulf monarchies and the international community that there is something different about Arab monarchy vis-à-vis -vis Arab uh, Republic authoritarianism. As such, we're perhaps going to see Saudi Arabia be behind, be the driving force behind, increasing financial and security collectivization of the Gulf states, where Saudi Arabia will continue to have to bail out poorer members such as Bahrain and Oman, and also provide physical security assistance when uprisings look like they're coming close to unseating rulers, as we've already seen in, uh, in Bahrain. Now, what's interesting is that when you began, uh, it, sound, it sounded as if you were not particularly impressed with monarchy as an institution, and uh, I don't, it doesn't sound like you buy into the argument that uh, the monarchies are unique or that they're uniquely stable or legitimate. But at the same time, you began our conversation by wanting to point back to a political culture kind of argument, which would suggest that, that there actually is something distinct or unique about the monarchy as a, as a political institution. So what, what are your thoughts on, on, the, on the uniqueness or the political relevance of, 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 of the monarchical institution? as a form of government? Yes, in many ways this book is, uh, is an example of reverse engineering. Uh, nearly half of the book looks at the remarkable resilience and survival strategies of these, of, these, uh, of these regimes, paying due attention, as I mentioned earlier, to both the economic and political culture pillars to explain how they've managed to achieve such seemingly enduring legitimacy over the past few decades. However, the book also tries to, to draw that uh, uh, further into more, more contemporary era, specifically beyond the Arab Spring, looking at how many of the actions and policies the Gulf states have been pursuing in the last few years seem to be helping to unravel more quickly than many people have anticipated these social contracts, ruling bargains, or legitimacy pillars. But, but, but that's interesting because you know, many people might look at the Gulf states and say, sure, they have problems, but actually they're quite resilient uh, between having all the financial resources, having the international support from the West, that uh, you know, they might be with you all the way up until you know, page 200 or so. But then when you get to the part about the collapse or their inability to cope with these challenges, you might end up losing people. So how do you make that final link? What is it that makes you believe that, that the regimes will be unable to grapple with the challenges that I think you document you know, very effectively in the first part of the book? Yes, I think many would look at this region from a very realist perspective. It's still relatively uh, wealthy in resources. It still has fairly small populations. It has powerful militaries. It has powerful repressive apparatus, if need be. And, of course, it has the backing of many large sections of the international community, too. Uh, however, uh, what I've tried to show is that looking at the uh, populations, the resources, the economic ex explanations are not going to be enough to understand what's likely to happen next. That's why the final chapter of the book, in particular the first part of it, looking at these super-modernizing forces I describe, 
explain why we're now got starting to see a permanent shift in how the societies and the citizens of these countries are going to think about their rulers. For the first time in this region's history, it is now possible for citizens in these states to communicate with each other horizontally through social media, various new uh, communications technologies, also benefit from improved IT infrastructure, improved education and so on. In the past, regimes, uh, governments and states in this region were very effective at being able to co-opt these modernizing forces, whether it was education, the media and so on. Now we're starting to see a new chapter in this region's history. We've started to see a very reactionary response from the, uh, from the authorities, trying to police cyberspace, police media more heavily than before, trying to distract their populations from these new technologies, but it's unlikely to last much longer. And so it really is, the, the driving force then it seems is not just the economic problems or even the demonstration effect from the Arab Spring, but ultimately you really see it as the, this rising generation, the new information technology and the like, which is fundamentally changing something about the ruling bargain. Yes, most of my research has been on how, how the modernization of society uh, uh, has been very different in the last few years and is likely to lead to very uh, powerful shifts in relations between rulers and ruled. That said, I would also say, and the book tries to make this point, that there's very much a perfect storm forming for the Gulf states where the new economic realities are happening at the same time as the new modernizing forces with the catalyst effect of the Arab Spring on the broader, broader doorstep. What about regime strategies of divide and rule, which have worked so well for so long, uh, playing tribe against tribe, Sunni against Shia? Uh, is it possible that you end up getting more mobilization, but not unification for political change? Yes, absolutely. I think what we've seen since the beginning of the Arab Spring and since the beginning of first real protests on the streets of the Gulf monarchies, we've seen many of the, the governments and authorities fall back on old tried and tested strategies namely the demonization of opposition, trying to portray these to their own citizens and the international community, as in the past communists, Islamists, Muslim Brotherhood, agents of Iran, etc. This is now reared its head once more in the wake of the Arab Spring, especially in Bahrain, where we have a substantial Shia population that needs to be pitted against the smaller Sunni ruling minority and the bulk of the Saudi population. We've seen how United Arab Emirates, having a fairly homogenous population in, term of, in terms of sect, has had to resort to another bogeyman image, this time uh, uh, a group of political prisoners who've been branded as being in league with a foreign power, namely Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. And then, of course, in Saudi Arabia, something very similar with the treatment of the Shia. Yes, in Saudi Arabia, the first protests were fairly local in the eastern province, which made it fairly easy for the Saudi authorities including their allies in the religious establishment, to portray these opponents as Shia and thus as part of some kind of sectarian struggle or Gulf-Iran struggle. However, quite devastatingly for the Saudi authorities in the past few months, we've seen protests pop up even in other parts of the country, including even Wahhabi uh, heartlands up in the north of Saudi Arabia, where these protests can no longer be pushed under the carp carpet as part of a sectarian struggle or a movement involving, involving foreign agents or powers. Now, here in Washington, there's a, you know, some people are starting to ask, does this mean that we should uh, be you know, changing our military posture in the Gulf, uh, take the military, the naval base out of Bahrain, rethink our relationship with the Saudis? Do you, think this, do you think it's possible? What do you think would happen if the United States did it? I think the United States, Britain, and the other Western governments are in a very difficult position at the moment. They've effectively sought to ring-fence the Gulf monarchies as being aloof from the Arab Spring, thus are perhaps not neutral when they're approaching the problem at the moment, are more than ready to believe public relations experts and propagandists when it comes to perpetuating the myths of sectarian struggle or Iran-backed movements in the region. I think what we're perhaps going to see is as the opposition groups become more organized in the Gulf, they start to create proper uh, manifestos, which I believe are already in the process of being uh, written, to demonstrate to Western partners and other parts of the international community that new governments or constitutional monarchies that might eventually take shape have no problem in still maintaining uh, uh, Western uh, bases in their territories, have no problem still slotting into the uh, global economy, have no problem with renewing international oil concessions. So finding ways to reassure 
Yes, I think we're, we're going to see the, the opposition movements move away from being fragmented, ragtag uh, groups of, uh, of individuals, youth activists, stateless persons, Islamists, etc. We're going to see far more unification with a common goal of pushing towards constitutional monarchy uh, as the very first step. And if that is met with repression and further uh, antagonism and reactionary behaviour from ruling elites, then we'll see the opposition pushing things to the next step. Already in Bahrain, we've seen the early protests, which were simply petitioning the king to fulfill long-held promises, quickly shifting to down-with-the-king protests. All right. Well, I wish we could talk longer. This is fascinating. But um, uh, this is uh, Christopher Davidson, uh, After the Sheikhs, The Coming Collapse of the Gulf Monarchies. And uh, thanks for joining us here at the Poem Ups Conversations. Thank you, Mark.